just wanted to uh, welcome everybody here. My name is Will Costello. I am joining you from uh, my house and my wife just pulled out a pan of her fresh made granola for like breakfast, uh, like yogurt and acai bowls and everything. And it smells freaking amazing. It's like cinnamon, clove, nutmeg. It just is incredible. I was going to talk today specifically about how I would approach writing a wine list and how I do it from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, obviously, being a master sommelier, part of our focus is being able to be specific about not only restaurant type, right? Chinese food restaurant, German food restaurant, Thai food restaurant, fine dining, Italian cuisine, a little bistro, whatever, but also to be able to make the wine list fit every part of the business, right? The price point, how much storage you have, uh, whether you would really want to whether you would really want to add a bunch of selections to the wine list that you think are never going to sell just because you want to be hip and cool, or mainly you just want to stick with the classics because you want to make money, right? Um, at the end of the day, if it's your restaurant or your wine bar or your fine dining venue, you can do whatever you want, but most of the times we don't own our own restaurants. So we are needing to follow the guidance of a strong business plan. And that of course, business plan is, um, going to guide where we're going to go. So yeah, I was going to talk today through a number of different uh, ways that I evaluate how I go through a wine list. When I looked at how to evaluate how I would write a wine list, I would look at it from this way, right? How much storage space do I have? The average menu price, the education of both my staff and the consumers themselves, and obviously how many staff members I have, inventory management, how often I want to do inventory, and then finally, uh, table turn time. And this goes back to the whole business. So let's start from the beginning. I'm gonna go through this talking about whether I was running a fish taco taco place. There's a really great place in Encinitas called Fish 101. It's right on the ocean. Uh, you get fresh fish caught every day. They pretty much make burritos, tacos, bowls. That's it. Obviously they focus on beer. They do like local kombucha. I think they have a couple glasses of wine, although I wasn't really um, watching, looking for that when I went in there, I was having a big cerveza, right? Um, whether I was running a bistro, and this is something where you consider, look, they have a bunch of different everyday foods. Think about sandwiches and soups, think about burger, maybe a steak, maybe they have like a roast chicken, uh, maybe there's a house special pasta, you know, just an everyday, even look at it like a fine diner, right? Um, and how I'd write a wine list for that. Whether I was at a wine bar focused primarily on the wine, people came there at five o'clock to seven o'clock after work. They sat down to get a glass of wine, maybe a bottle of wine. They're meeting friends there. In any case, they're focusing on the wine and not necessarily the food that goes along with it. And then finally, um, whether we're at a five-star restaurant and I'm bringing the most experience from running five-star restaurant, large 2200 selection wine lists, but eventually bringing it back to the idea that, look, I dine out a lot and I know where I like to eat. And usually it's not a five-star restaurant. It's one or two times a year maximum, usually special birthday or our anniversary or if we're traveling abroad, right? So when I think about it from that perspective, I often try to put my head in every single area. So let's think about storage to start off with, right? If I knew that I had a restaurant that had, let's call it a large closet to store wine. This is, let's say, you know, if you have a, a walk-in closet in your house, that's actually pretty big for most restaurants, but let's assume it's a walk-in closet and that is your entire storage space for your restaurant for wine. You're of course gonna have a couple by the glass options behind the bar. You might have a service station and the side if you're only doing a couple BTGs that up above have your three major reds, your three major whites, but everything you're gonna store for the rest of that has to be in a walk-in closet size. For me, I would write that list no more than 75 to 80 selections for sure, because I wanna make sure that inventory management is easy, that service is easy. I don't wanna to have to be the one, if I'm the manager, walking to get every single bottle. Tim, whose section is six tables over there, should be able to walk in and get uh, a new bottle on his own because somebody ordered the Santa Barbara Central Coast Chardonnay from Ballard Lane and go be able to grab it, right? It shouldn't be my obligation. So I would look at the amount of storage space that I have first to start off with. And that would dictate how many selections I can have. 
This doesn't necessarily mean that 75 would be my top. Maybe I can store 75 cases in there. Maybe I want to do 125 because I want to have two bottles of a $400 Burgundy, two bottles of Opus One, a couple bottles of something, you know, from South Africa. That's super cool. But if I'm talking about it, the, my volume is going to be stored in the majority of that space and the smaller number of selections will fall elsewhere, right? Now, I would also look at my buying habits too. Um, your wine list directly dictates how much work you are going to want to do or going to need to do. For example, I always had a wine list where I only kept a par of like two in the restaurant and maybe two or three more downstairs. It wasn't a very big likelihood that a party of 16 was going to come in, that they were going to order every single bottle of something that I had. And I always recognized that, yes, I would be doing a lot more work. Now, that was my preference. I could have minimized my list drastically to about 250 selections, kept a case of everything on hand and never had to worry about it. If something got to a two par, I could reorder so it really has to do with how much work you want to do. If you want to write the wine list for that really cool, really hip place that constantly has something new, that people who love wine are eager to come in, they always want to talk to the bartender or the sommelier, they want to know, hey, I, I heard that you got a new Northern Loire Co or Malbec and you know only got one of the two cases that came into the state. Yeah, you're going to have to work that list a lot more. But you probably are passionate about it and excited to do it. Um, reprints, right? If you have a much longer list and your storage is much smaller, your reprints that you're going to be doing are much, much, much more difficult, right? So if I have 250 selections and I keep a one part of everything and I only get deliveries on Thursdays, well, I'm going to constantly having to white out something on the menu. I'm going to have to reprint it until I can get it back in stock. I'm going to have to have to pre-shift every day with the staff and tell them, hey, take out your pens, everybody in your section, cross out these wines on page two, this one on page four, that one, whatever. So your reprint schedule should affect how big your wine list is. And to me, I only reprinted once every three months. I had a huge list. And if I had something that got cut off, it's fine. I'm not expecting that in the next three months, somebody's going to order that super unique Steen from South Africa. It's not that important to me. So if they did, I usually went back to the table and went, wow, you are a really savvy buyer. Great, great selection. I have to admit though, that I sold out of it and haven't had a chance to reprint it. So if you want to run a wine list that is easy, look at your storage space, figure out how large it is, keep the list to a minimum, keep a high par on whatever you're running and only keep track of it as often as you need to, right? If you have a SKU that runs through two or three or four cases a month, well, great, you know to keep an eye on that, but you're limiting the size of your list to the amount of work that you wanna do. Um, the last thing that you would look at is, again, price sensitivity in your storage space, right? If I only had a walk-in closet that had no refrigeration, I was only going to be working out of that space, yeah, maybe I can put some racks up or I can build some bins to store things, but really I'm just working with a hopefully not south facing window in a restaurant and somewhere that can be a little bit cool. I would consider the fact that maybe my wine list shouldn't have a ton of high price point items on it. I shouldn't have a Conterno Barolo or something super special like first growth Bordeaux because I'm not gonna be able to store them somewhere. And yeah, you might have a reserve list, but maybe that reserve list literally is under lock and key and kept in the manager's office and you have 12 or 24 bottles of something, right? So all of this goes back to storage. The second thing I would look at, and a lot of people don't think about how they write their wine list from average menu price. Now, when I go back to the idea that I talked about a taco stand, you can get at Fish 101, a bowl with fresh fish like white sea bass, brown rice, veggies, and like a sauce for like 10 bucks. Maybe it's 12, whatever. So if I went there with you and we were sitting down and we're having lunch, I would say, okay, we're spending with tax 15 bucks each. So 30 bucks. That to me is the sweet spot to where you should have your average of prices on a wine list. 
to me at that restaurant, I would be having peak pool. I would be having Chenin Blanc. I would be having some inexpensive stuff like uh, Pine Ridge Chenin Viognier blend. It's like a super porch pounder, easy to drink, right? Um, I would be having stuff like Claret and Bourbon and you know, Riesling from Washington, stuff that's relatively inexpensive. And when I make my purchase from wholesale, mark it up a reasonable amount, I'm going to fall between the 15 to 45 price point for every bottle. Two times the entree will equal my average bottle price, right? And that makes it simple. So again, I have two people sitting down, 15 bucks per, per meal is going to give me a $30 bottle. Now, if four people sit down, and they order a $30 bottle, well, my revenue is still at 30 bucks. So yeah, could I have something more expensive? Sure, but do I really want to, as the number of people go up, a six top and eight top alienate them? Probably not. I really want to have it as my average of what I would take as two people at a place like a fish taco place, right? If I was looking at a bistro, I would then look at it a little bit different. I might look at from the fact that, yeah, I have a lot of four tops that come in, my average entree price is 18 to 25 bucks. Most of the time people have a salad. So I'm, let's take 20 bucks as an average. 20 times four is going to give us 80 bucks. And this is where I would have the majority of my bottles on that list. Sure, somebody who comes in as a two top is going to look at 80 bucks and they might go, wow, this is kind of expensive. But you want to have the majority of them in that price point. And this is why price point targeting is kind of interesting because price point targeting gives you the chance to change consumer understanding. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Education for wine list is important. Am I the only person who knows anything about wine in that taco shop? Am I the one who's going to have to talk to every single person who doesn't know about it? Am I the one who's going to have to do every single bit of uh, work on the list? Well, if so, I should probably make it as easy as possible because if I get in the weeds, I'm not going to have the time to uh, go talk to every table, right? Whereas if I work in a, in a taco shop where everybody likes to go to a wine region on the weekends and we all like to have blind tasting nights and we've all traveled to different parts of the world. This is somewhere that I would love to work with some friends, right? We, we finished our careers in five star and we finally wanted to go own a fish taco stand near Ensenada, but have a sick wine list. Yeah, sure. You might have that. But to me, I would look at the education of not only my staff, but also the education of the guests. I can relatively suspect that if somebody is going to come into my taco shop and I'm at a taco shop in Ensenada, that they're not coming there for the wine list. So am I going to have high minded, you know, very unique, super special stuff on there? No, I'm probably going to stick to a low price point with things that taste good with fish and greens and tortillas and spicy or creamy sauces, right? Sauvignon Blanc, Gruner Veltliner, maybe because you can get some great values for like $9.95. California, Central Coast, Chardonnay, Riesling from Washington, you know, peak pool and stuff that people don't know about. Sure, because it's a $10 or $12 or $15 bottle, right? Um, and then finally, uh, how often you want to count your inventory to me would be an important part of how I would write my wine list and how I lay out my wine list. Am I gonna have to count my wine inventory every week? I know there are some corporations out there that require a count every single week. To me, that's a pain in the ass, right? Um, counting your wine every single week. I did mine once a month and I had a, what, $420,000 inventory on premise at the restaurant. And then I went and downstairs counted the same amount roughly of inventory in our dry store. So we had like, a million dollars worth of wine, give or take, right? That was once a month. If I had to count that every single week, that would have changed how I wrote the wine list. So to me, um, managing the workload is the first place I would start. So again, to cover that, and again, if you guys want to ask me questions, please post them in the notes or the comments, however that works. And I'm very happy to uh, do my best to try to answer those questions for you. So yeah, to cover those again, how I would evaluate a wine list from the beginning. Storage size, buying habits, reprints, out of stocks, and then price sensitivity. The average menu price is how I would write the wine list, trying to target something that's roughly two times the average menu price for a, a couple. Um, education of the staff and the consumer. Inventory management and how often or how hard I want to work or the company requires. And then the last one I didn't talk about was average turn time for a table. Look, 
if we're talking about a bistro where somebody's sitting down for an hour and a half on a Wednesday night, they're just going out to dinner, maybe I can put a little bit more information and a longer list together because somebody might want to have a special bottle for an hour and a half. If I was at a wine bar, yeah, you want to have a good amount of selections, but truthfully, what do I want? I want them to sit down at the bar. I want them to order a bottle. I want to get them two glasses, a plate of crackers, charcuterie, pork riette, and I want them to drink it quickly and either order another one and leave, or, or I'm sorry, order another one or leave, those two, right? So when you look at it from that perspective, your turn time should dictate your list length. You don't want at that taco shop where somebody's coming in for a half hour to have to pour over 16 pages of wine to pick something because their food's getting cold and they just wanna come in and eat. The opposite is true if you're at a five-star restaurant. I'm sitting down spending $700 for a couple to eat some of the finest cuisine in the world, Pierre Gagnier, three Michelin star chef. I wanna pick the right two bottles for my meal. And I wanna tell the service staff, yo, I'm gonna be here for two and a half hours, three hours. So give me some time, I'm gonna spend some money, but I want them to be the right ones. I can find something cool from Edmond Vatan from Clolaneor in Sancerre and a specific little village of Chavignol. And I have time because I can look through 135 pages and that's what they want you to do. But look at your turn time and that's how your restaurant list should be written. All right, going from there, now that we've figured out the size of our list, now we want to figure out how to lay it out. And I know there's a lot of different ways to lay it out. We can do it from just the basics, red and white. You can of course have a separate wine list if you need to. I love the fact that if it's a bistro kind of turn and burn restaurant, have it on the back of the menu. Um, you can do it from old world and new world. Although again, that goes back to customer education. If somebody doesn't know what the old world is, how are they gonna find a bottle that they like? Or what if they just pick something from that side because it's $22, you get it to the table and they're used to having oaky fruity stuff and they open it and they're not happy, right? So it comes with a little bit of education. Um, modern versus traditional, right? You can have, if you're just an Italian place, a trattoria, you can have a list of modern and a list of traditional if you're only focusing on like Piedmontese cuisine. But again, that goes back to education of not only your staff, but of your uh, customers too, because how do they know that they like modern style Barolo or Barbaresco, or even, you know, Northern uh, Piedmontese modern style versus something that's super, super, super traditional, right? Um, do you write your wine list with fancy names? I don't always think that the fancy name approach is the way to go where you're like bubbly and fun or like tart and tangy or, you know, alliteration kind of stuff. Because to me, that doesn't always tell me as now an educated buyer where I can find Chinon on the list, right? Whereas if it was white and red, I would know that it's in the red section. Yeah, I might have to look through it and find it, but am I gonna actually need to do that? Yeah, if I might not be able to find it during that specific fancy name. The last part is how granular do you want to go? This should go with that quality of restaurant, right? If I'm just making fish tacos, in Encinitas, I want to have something that says peak pool 2018, $14. That's it. So when my mom walks up and she's like, oh, let's have some wine for lunch here. What do you want? And she hands it to somebody else who doesn't know. Somebody just goes, can I have the peak pool 2019? I don't need to have producer. I don't need to have uh, region. I don't need to have anything. If I just have Sauvignon Blanc 2019 for 12 bucks. If somebody wants to, they can say, Hey, where's that from? Is it from France? Is it from New Zealand? Is it from somewhere? But if you're going too granular, uh, sometimes you're going to lose your customer base. Opposite side of that is, you know, we find ourselves in the middle, right? At a bistro or a wine bar. Those to me kind of fall in the middle section. Yeah. You have people who just love the food, but they know a little bit about wine. They want to be able to come in and they want to look at, um, they want to find Chinon or they want, they don't just want to order the Loire Valley Cab Franc and then have to wave down the waiter. Hey, real quick, can I ask a question? I see on the menu, it just says Cabernet Franc Loire Valley and maybe a producer, Philippe Allier, right? Um, can you tell me what production this is? Is it the cuvee that's, you know, the 
Loire Valley Appalachian? Is it the Chinon? Which cuvee is this? But when you get too granular, like what I did in some cases, I had Sonoma Chardonnay broken down into multiple sections where I had Russian River Valley, Green Valley of Russian River, Sonoma Coast, Occidental, uh, you know, all of these other Sonoma Valley, all of these other Appalachians. And somebody just wanted to order Peter Michael. That's it. They just wanted to order Peter Michael. If I would have just put them in Sonoma Chardonnay or even California Chardonnay, somebody could just look, find Peter Michael, order it. And now my restaurant made more money. So sometimes going a little too granular hurts you in the long run. Pricing. Now, this is one thing that I've talked to a few friends about, and I really think it's an interesting uh, perspective when you talk about pricing. I know I mentioned taking something like an entree, doubling it because you're assuming that two people are going to sit down and share a bottle of wine, but there is some psychology that can go into, I hope it's still live. Okay. There is some psychology that goes into how you're going to um, price your menu. For example, at Addison uh, or at Twist, we had a wine list that had on average $135 check average for a bottle. Now, how did we achieve that? Sure, we had a couple bottles that were 60, we had a couple that were 70, but on average, when you looked at our list, we had a bunch of things that were six, seven, eight hundred dollars We had a bunch of things that were 200 to 100, and then we had a few things that were 60, 70, 80 bucks. So when you look at a list, you're like, that's 110, that's 125, that's 150, that's 135, that's 130, that's 125, that's 115, that's 60, that's 85, that's 130, that's 120, that's 125. All of these all the way through are eventually giving us uh, a guideline through psychology saying, well, on average, I'm gonna spend about 130 bucks. Okay, I get it. Um, with that, you can change your restaurant perspective because if people come in, and you never, ever, 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 ever sell that $400 bottle. My first restaurant I worked at in San Diego was called Blue Fire Grill. You know what the hottest bottle on the list was? Opus One. Can't even remember how much it was back then. This was in 2004. Opus One probably was 250 bucks. Maybe it was 300 bucks on the list, right? Every single time that bottle went out to the dining room, there were cheers from the staff. The manager knew about it. It was like a big, pardon my language, big fucking deal um, because it was the one wine that was the highest on the list. What could I do if I wanted to sell more Opus? Well, I'm going to put something that's 800, 1,000, 1,200, 900, 650, and 500 on that list. How many of them am I, I going to buy? I'm going to buy one bottle of each of those because they're not going to move very often. But you know what? How's that Opus going to look compared to those $1,200 and $900 bottles? Now people are going to look at it and go, oh, Opus, 300 bucks? Cool. Can I have a bottle of Opus, please? And it's not going to be so much fanfare because we changed the psychology of that wine list to make $300 spending here seem like normal. Does that apply to your taco shop? Probably and absolutely not. I might have something that's 110 bucks on there and that might be the one that's going to go out, but I don't really want to sell $110 bottles. They're probably going to sit too long and it's not going to move through my inventory. Um, so you're going to cost average essentially across your goals as well. And this is where budgeting comes into play also. So if you know that January, February, March, every day this year, we had a check average of 62.25 for our wine list. And now you're going through the budgeting process and you want your restaurant to grow and you're seeing food and covers and average spend go up three to 4%. Maybe let's go big and say 10%. And your beverage costs, or I'm sorry, your revenue stays the same. You're still at 62.50 all the time. And you're like, well, we're making more money. People are ordering more expensive food. Our covers are going up. What's happening? Why is my 6250 consistent there? Well, what you can do is add a few more things to the high end because potentially you're bringing in more revenue. So you have a little bit more leeway with your dollar and you can now make those 
six, seven, eight hundred, or if we're talking about maybe Chardonnay, three hundred, two hundred and fifty, two hundred and sixty-five, one hundred and ninety-five dollar bottles. You can add a few more of those because what's it going to do to the sixty dollar? Well, it's going to make sixty dollar look kind of inexpensive. So now people will shoot for that eighty dollar price point that's somewhat in the middle. And this is just how you can work on psychology of wine list and getting people to order wine. If you want to raise your check price, it doesn't hurt to add a few more things at the high end that are going to make the average middle look a lot better. Here's one thing that I'm really excited to talk about, and this is verbiage on your wine list. I talked about it a little bit where if you want to sell wine quickly, make sure that it's easy for somebody to order. You want them to order the peak pool for 18 bucks, just right peak pool. Yeah, you can put a producer in there and put the price point and you're done. Hey, can I have a bottle of the peak pool? You're done. No big deal. Real world experience. At uh, Twist in Las Vegas, we had a wine list that, again, 2200 selections. I think I had something like 35 or 40 different selections on the by the glass. This included port. This included, you know, a flight of different 10, 20, 30, 40 tawnies. And we always had like three or four champagnes. I found a champagne, absolutely loved it, called Bernard Gaucher, G-A-U-C-H-E-R. Now, Las Vegas is one of these places where people from all over the world came to visit. And by the way, you all need to come back, okay? Everybody needs to come back to Las Vegas. We need you back in our casinos and our restaurants, on the strip, gambling, spending money. So please look at this as a place you'd come back for a... a vacation. They're probably going to be the hardest ones hit. Dayton, Ohio is going to be all right when things open back up. But Las Vegas, I mean, we need you. Please, please. I'm, I'm begging for you. But we had that Bernard Gaucher with people from China, from France, from Australia, from Dayton, Ohio, and from Alaska coming into the restaurant. And if they didn't know how to pronounce Gaucher, G-A-U-C-H-E-R, what did they do? They skipped champagne because they didn't want to say, hey, can I have the Bernard Gotcher? Or if they're from Australia, they'd go, hey, can I have the Bernard Gotcha? No, they want to say, can I have the Bernard Gaucher? But if they don't know how to say it, they're not going to order it. So what did I do? I changed it to Champagne BG. You ever heard of Champagne BG? Me neither. But you know what? Bernard Gaucher, I bet when he's at home, Somebody around his house calls him BG, tells him to get his ass over here and do the dishes. So I changed it to champagne BG. And you know what happened to the sales? They went up. The reason is that you have the opportunity to change the comfort level of your guest by your own writing. I didn't need to put champagne Bernard Gaucher because when I walk over the table and I show the bottle and somebody goes, Oh, is that champagne BG? I'm like, absolutely. It says Bernard Gaucher, champagne BG, right? And everybody feels good because we weren't lying. We just changed it a little bit. Take, for example, you have something called Malaguzia on your wine list. And that would be incredible with my fish taco place. Well, you know what? I probably wouldn't put Malaguzia on my list for $23. You know what I'm going to put? I'm going to put that little like spelling thing, like in the dictionary when they spell it out. And I'm going to put M-A-U-L-U-H-G-O-O-Z-I-A, Malaguzia. And somebody's going to go, oh, cool. I know how to say it. Can I have the Malaguzia for 23 bucks? Or, hey, what if I really, really, really want to sell that one? You know what I like to do? I like to put a box around it. And I'm still going to put Malaguzia. And I'm going to put lilies, rose petals, star jasmine, tropical fruit, because that's the wine I want to sell. It's got a big box around it. It's easy to say. And I gave some specific notes on what it tastes like. All of those things help you to sell. And you know what, when your Malaguzia is gone and you need to sell Bourbalonk because you got a deal on closeout, put that in a box and have that one on your list. So these are all ways that you can use verbiage or uh, layout. I sometimes would even change colors of certain pages and put like a bright yellow or bright pink page in there. And you know what? They would be like top 100. Somebody would turn to it and go, whoa, this is super cool. I didn't even see all those, even though they were within the rest of the list. Last thing I would talk about is you can use changing skews and selections to make wine edit ordering easy. For example, pink wine. You don't need to go in and reprint the by the glass page 
every single night or every single week because that deal that you got on this Cote de Provence Rosé from whatever producer, it's now out of stock and you can't get it anymore, but you found another producer from some other region, from some other pink grape, from blah, blah, you know, you're making, you're making a decision based upon the fact that it's pink at a certain price point. So what do you put? You put pink wine, a rotating selection of my favorites. And you know what? How easy is it for somebody to say, hey, can I have a glass of the pink wine? Or can I have a bottle of your pink wine of the day? All of those things make it easy and fun to order. Would I do this in a fine dining restaurant? Sure, maybe. And in fact, I did. I did rotating unique grape of the week. And I would just put it, oh, hi, Dottie. Hey, everybody, that's Dottie. She, uh, she likes to get on camera and preen for everybody. Um, but yeah, I would put pink wine on there. And the last thing I would say is only be as specific to your appellation as you need to be. If you put uh, a white burgundy, let's call it Pierre Yves Colomb Moray, and you got Saint Aubin uh, and Remy Premier Cru 2018 available by the glass. Well, I might put PYCM, Saint Aubin, Premier Cru, and leave it at that on my by the glass, even at a fine restaurant, because people who know might want to ask oh, hey, what Premier Cru is it? Or maybe I might add Burgundy in there and leave it at that, Saint Aubin Burgundy, because in that case, somebody who just wants a glass of white Burgundy, they're probably not gonna care which Premier Cru it is. They just know they wanted the white Burgundy and since I had one by the glass, it is what it is. The last thing I'd say, um, and feel free if you have any questions to post them below. Anna, thanks for your notes and Lisa, you as well. Um, last thing I would say is about buying habits and how to make a successful wine program. And this is primarily based upon volume and price, right? As your volume goes up, meaning number of bottles sold per week, you generally are going to see an indirect correlation with price. Unless you're one of those baller places in, I guess, Macau or Hong Kong that just gets people spending money constantly, right? Or Las Vegas sometimes your volume goes up usually with a lower price, right? The $12 glass is gonna sell more than the $18 glass. So what I did is I looked at my wine list and I made my own kind of buying habits. If I was buying it for wholesale between nine and $15, I was buying a full case. Didn't matter what it was, I was buying a full case. If it was between 16 and 25, I was buying nine bottles. And some people say, well, what about broken case charges? And I say, yeah, but what about time cost of money, right? If I have those extra three bottles sitting around for longer than it would have taken me just to sell nine, then I'm fine with paying that dollar broken case charge, right? I wrote my own schedule. And I, I don't memorize all of them anymore, but if I had something $200 and above, I usually only bought two bottles of them. And if I had something that was 500 bucks and above, I bought one of them. You know why? Because if I sold that one bottle of 1945 DRC Latash, and it, yeah, it's going to cost a lot more than 500 bucks. A, I'm, they're probably not having two. If they are, I'm happy to guide them into something else. But let's say they buy that one bottle. How long did it take me to sell? It might've taken me months to sell that. Years, who knows, to sell that bottle. Now that I had two around, I paid for it years and years and years ago. What's the point? Now I made some money. I can go buy another $500 bottle to replace it. Holding too much inventory on very high priced wines, even though the volume is low, is a bad idea. So you should adjust your buying habits to be inverse to each other. The lower the cost, the more you buy. The higher the cost, the less you buy, right? And don't let anybody talk you into anything about like, broken case charges. I'm very happy to pay a $12 broken case charge on a bottle that costs me 250 bucks than I am to buy six of them. I don't need six bottles at 250 bucks. I need two. That's it. Um, cool. Thank you all for listening. Obviously, any questions, please feel free to uh, post them in. I'm going to put this on YouTube as well in case you want to share it around. Uh, you can, of course, of course post some uh, comments or questions there, and I'm happy to answer them. And I really appreciate it. 
I've been given the opportunity to do this from being the CETO and Solomon Hills Estates. The Miller family have asked me to kind of do some other topics besides just our wine, but that doesn't stop you from being able to look at our wines, being a CETO and Solomon Hills, and think about them for your restaurants when they reopen. Reach out to me and I can share with some of our distributors and hopefully you can look at uh, putting them on your wine list. I want to thank you guys so much. All right. I'll see you guys soon with a couple guests as well. Thanks.